Hello. This is a short overview of some key ideas in English grammar. And we will be looking at sentences, clauses, phrases, and parts of speech. Let's start. Look at the sentence. The man with the long white beard standing at the far end of the old looking corridor is Dumbledore. As you can see, it is made up of words. And words can be divided into groups. Try dividing the sentence into parts, into groups of words. We'll look at some ways of doing this. Pause the video and try to divide the sentence. You can see three ways in which I have divided the sentence. First, we have this yellow part, which is, like all sentences, having two conceptual divisions. It's called, the first one in yellow is called subject, and that in white is called predicate. We'll look at what these terms are. First, let's look at what the divisions are like. Second sentence shows you phrases. Sentences can have phrases and clauses. Finally, the third sentence shows you words belonging to different classes, performing different functions. According to the function words perform in a given usage, they are classed into parts of speech. We're going to look at these ideas. First, let's look at a simple definition of a sentence. Here we are, we have a sentence is an arrangement of clauses and phrases grouped together with conjunctions or punctuation. This is a very simple definition of a sentence and it's my definition of a sentence. So, a sentence can be used to describe, that is to tell or speak about in words, in detail, try to represent in words some thing, some event phenomenon, something that you can sense. State or other to give facts, for example, or to make propositions, ask questions. What's the day today, for example? What is there? It's another question. Express the feeling or emotion. you know that. And uh, finally, make commands or requests. Read. Here is for you to see if it's a command or a request. Also, based on the structure, Sentences can be simple, compound, or complex. But we'll look at these in another video. So let's move on. Now, here are types of sentences based on their use. And I want you to match items on the left to items on the right. Remember that one item on the left can have more than one correspondence with items on the right. So pause the video and match the items on both sides. Now let's look at the answers to this exercise. Here they are. Declarative sentences are sentences that describe. Declarative sentences can also state or assert. Interrogative sentences ask questions. Exclamatory sentences express a feeling or emotion. Exclamatory sentences also express greetings. Imperative sentences make commands or requests, or they can also express wishes. Here's another exercise for you. Based on what we have seen, I'd like you to mark these sentences as either declarative, exclamatory, interrogative, or imperative. For example, this is a video about sentences. It's a declarative sentence. So I'd like you to pause the video, attempt an answer. Here are the answers. I hope you attempted an answer. Children play football in the park is a declarative sentence. It makes a statement. There is uh, the shop we are looking for. Again, a declarative sentence it may or may not be a fact. It is surely a description. Let us denote this parameter by X. This is the kind of sentence you'd find in a book, uh, the sciences. And uh, then you have a question. It's, it's a very common motif. It's called uh, an interrogative sentence, and uh, we have three exclamatory sen sentences. They are, oh dear, bless, how dear, hard, good gracious, goodness gracious. These are all expressing sudden emotion or feeling. Finally, the last three sentences are imperative sentences, and the either express requests or wishes or commands. First is a request, second, God save the king, is a wish. 
and peace. Here it is the command. Now that we have looked at what a sentence is, let's look at what a sentence is made up of. That is, let's look one by one at the ways which sentences can be divided into groups of words. First way, the division into subject and predicate. Subject is a group of words around a noun called the subject word or head word. A predicate includes a verb which tells us the state of or action performed by the subject. We'll illustrate this by an example. Now, the same sentence that we have looked at previously. The man with the long white beard standing at the far end of the old looking corridor. This is the subject for this sentence. And is Dumbledore as the predicate. So, the subject of the sentence is the group of words in yellow. The subject word being man. The words around man gave us more information about the subject word or the head word. And finally, the white part makes up the predicate. Okay, the verb in the predicate is is. Our own sentence can be thought of as the main clause and we'll come back to this in a bit. So, the subject is what the sentence is about and the predicate is what the sentence tells you about its subject. Now, another idea that we have hinted at is a clause. A clause, as you can see, a clause is an arrangement of words containing a predicate and a subject. The subject can be implied or stated. A clause, like sentences, can be of different types. And let's look at an example again. It's the same sentence and words in yellow isn't a clause, nor are the words in white. But there are two clauses. The first clause in the sentence is uh, standing at the far end of the old looking corridor. The second clause is the whole sentence, that is, the man with a long white beard standing at the far end of the old looking corridor is Dumbledore, which is also the main clause for this sentence. And the main clause can be a sentence. The blue words mark a clause. It has an implied subject word, that is, who, and a predicate, the verb, the verb of the predicate being standing. A verb is a word which expresses an action or state. The entire sentence is another example of a clause, as we have already remarked. Here, the subject is from the man up to corridor. Finally, the words in white form the predicate, as we have already seen. So, a clause must contain a subject and a predicate. As you can see, the words in blue contain both a subject, which is implied here, and a predicate. And therefore, it satisfies the conditions for a clause, and therefore we can call it a clause. Another idea is that of a phrase. A phrase is a group of words which is not a clause. That is, it can either have a subject or a predicate, but not both. Basically, it doesn't have to have the same structure as a clause. It doesn't have to have the relation between predicate and subject, which a clause must have. So let's look at an example. Okay, there are, I can see some phrases here in the sentence. For example, the man with long white beard is a phrase, it refers to some noun, and uh, the noun has some properties. The properties are, it's just one here, the long white beard, or beard. Um, at the far end of the old looking corridor is another phrase. It's a particular type of phrase. So is uh, the man with the long white beard. And I'm not going into that right now. And standing and is number of themselves can be thought of as phrases. Finally, we have another phrase, the one you can see in yellow, which is the man with the long white beard standing at the far end of the old looking corridor. This again is a phrase. And here we see that a phrase may contain a clause because as you've seen already, standing at the far end of the old looking corridor is a clause. And here we have who implied, who is standing at the far end of the old looking corridor. Ultimately, this phrase is a noun phrase and I'm not going into that right now. Finally, the third kind of division we saw was into parts of speech. A part of speech or word class is a label denoting the function a group of words performs in a given usage. Uh, let's see what this means. Uh, here's another sentence. It's the previous sentence modified a bit. I'll read it for you. Behold, 
The man with the long white beard standing at the far end of the old walking corridor is Dumbledore. And verily, he has a candy in his hand. Now, you can see these words are coloured. And the colours represent different classes the words belong to. We will not go into articles right now, but I have coloured them nonetheless. So, as you may have noticed, there are eight parts of speech described by traditional grammar. There are more than eight colours there. Might have noticed. Nouns, adjectives, pronouns, verbs, adverbs, interjections, conjunctions, and prepositions. In English, and this is of significance, in English, the same word may belong to more than one part of speech or word class. Let's look at these parts of speech briefly. Uh, there's an exercise for you again. I want you to match uh, the eight items on the left to those on the right. And I want you to pause the video and try to answer the question. I hope you did try to answer the question. Here are the answers. I'll read them out for you. Verbs describe an action or state. Adjectives describe attributes or properties of names. Nouns are names. Pronouns substitute for names or nouns. Adverbs describe verbs adjectives and adverbs, prepositions relate words to each other, interjections express emotion or feeling, and finally conjunctions are used to connect parts of sentences and sentences together. Now let's look at some examples of these. But first, um, can you tell me which part of speech each of the words in sentence belongs to? Pause the video, try to answer the question. Then we'll look at the answer together. So here are the parts of speech labeled. Verbs in the sentence are standing, is and has. The man standing at the far end of the corridor and so on. Is Dumbledore and so on. Has a candy and so on. Conjunctions. There's just one conjunction here, which is and. It joins two independent clauses or words together. We'll look at what these things mean later. Nouns there are, they are man, beer, end, corridor, candy, and hand. So there's this man who's standing at the far end of the corridor. He has a long white beard and uh, the end of the corridor is another noun, end. And corridor is a noun again, a name. Candy is a noun, it's easy, and so is hand. There's just one pronoun and it is he. Adjectives are long, white, far, old-looking, and his. Adverbs, which modify adjectives, verbs, or adverbs. There's just one of them, which is verily. Prepositions, which connect words, or which relate words, are three, number, in this sentence, and they are with, at, and off. At the far end of the corridor, with the long white bear, and lastly, there's just one interjection and it is behold. It's a word used to draw attention towards something. And it has, it is expressing emotion too. So it's an interjection. Finally, once again, a verb is a word or group of words which states uh, an action or a state. Conjunctions join parts of sentences and sentences together. Nouns are names. Pronouns are substitutes for nouns or names. Adjectives describe the qualities or attributes or properties or nouns. Adverbs describe adjectives, verbs or adverbs. Prepositions describe relationship between words. Finally, interjections express emotion or feeling. Now, we have looked at these ideas so far. and They are a sentence, a clause, a phrase, conjunctions, punctuation, Punctuation is simply the marks you use, for example, the full stop or the parentheses or colon, semicolon, dash, etc. Subject, predicate, parts of speech or word classes. And now that we have looked at these ideas briefly, we'll look at more examples of each. But before, let's have a look at one of the parts of speech. So conjunctions. Conjunctions are words used to join or connect or group together words, phrases, clauses and sentences. We'll illustrate this with an example. 
So here are some examples of conjunctions. Conjunctions describe choices and togetherness, reasons and conditions. For example, you can have this or that. That is, you cannot have both. We, we can buy jam or butter, either jam or butter, not both, not jam and butter, jam or butter. It is either day or night. He is a boy or girl. He is used for a boy. So he is a boy or girl. Then I want apples and milk. Both. Both things. When you want two things, you'd say, I want this and that. Then when you want to give reasons, you can use many conjunctions. Here is one. And it gives you a slight degree of uh, force that is used to convey reasoning logical relations among causes and effects then you have uh, another use of and that is to connect two sentences together these are two sentences that you can see they are there they are what waiting for us you can take up these two sentences and put them together using and they are there and they are waiting for us it rained all day so we stay, stayed inside this is giving reason for our staying inside either you or i go not both you and I don't go. You go or I go. One of us go. She ran for it, but the train was gone. But contrasts two sentences, two ideas, two different statements, let us say. I'm hungry, but I don't want food. They're two different contrasting statements, okay? Although is one of the conjunctions used for expressing conditions. So Although Fred likes crackers, he abstains from them. That is, Fred likes crackers, still he does not have them, he does not eat them. So he abstains from them. Although he likes them, he abstains from them. So it expresses condition. Finally, in the last sentence, and connects two nouns, two words. Fred and George like each other, that is, Fred likes George, George likes Fred. There are two sentences, you can combine them using and like this. Fred and George like each other. Now here's some practice for things you learned today. And I'd like you to pause each exercise and try to answer the question before you look at the answers. Let's start. The first exercise is on conjunctions. And as you've seen, conjunctions join sentences and words together. That is, sentences to sentences, words to words. And so on. I'll read it for you. I want you to solve it. I want you to find all the conjunctions and try to write the meaning of these. Try to break it into multiple sentences like we did in the previous set of examples. Fred and George are talking to each other and their talk is about Molly and morning time. They are also playing cards. They must do as they are told or they will be in trouble. For Muller is to return soon. Now, these two seem likely to bother not to budge. After the game is over, they hurry to do what they are told to. And although Muller is back on time, they do manage to stay out of trouble. I pause the video and try to find all the conjunctions and break these sentences into simpler sentences like we did in the previous examples. Now, here are your answers. We have Fred and George are talking and talking to each other and their talk is about Molly and and but and also or for neither nor after although and so. Now we'll look at them in detail. The first sentence. Fred and George are talking and talking to each other and their talk is about Molly and morning time. Now Fred is talking to George and George is talking to Fred. You combine these two sentences to make a clause. Fred and George are talking. Next, talking and talking means they are talking a lot. It simply means that there is an emphasis on their activity or action. Their talk is about Molly, their talk is about morning time. You combine these two sentences in this way, as shown in the first sentence. Their talk is about Molly and morning time. Next sentence. But they are also playing cards. In addition to their or activity of talking, they are playing cards. That is, with the other things they are doing, they are also doing another activity which is playing a game, a game of cards. They must do as they are told 
or they'll be in trouble. Yeah. There, this sentence expresses a future event that is likely to occur if a condition is not satisfied in the present. That is, they are told something that they must do what they have been told to. Otherwise, or else, in the case that they fail to do this, they will find themselves in trouble. Next sentence. For Molly is to return soon. Now we see the source of trouble maybe. So for gives you a reason for an observation maybe. That is, they must follow commands from someone who is not mentioned. It may be Molly. They will be in trouble and they want to avoid finding themselves in trouble. That's why they must do as they are told or they will find themselves in trouble. And these two sentences, that is, they must do as they are told, or they will be in trouble, or they will be in trouble, and formally to return soon, give you a pair of proposition or a cause and effect, let's say. That is, cause will be, they are not doing as they are told, the effect will be finding themselves in trouble. Now the next sentence is, now, these two seem neither to bother nor to bite. That is, not one option and not another option. They seem not to bother, they seem not to budge. They don't care about what's going to happen to them, they're not concerned about it and they're not doing anything for it. That's what is meant by not budging here. The next sentence, but after the game's over, they hurry to do what they're told to. In the immediate future, when the card game is over, they'll be doing what they're told to. They'll be hurrying, that is, make haste, making haste or getting themselves up and quickly to do what they're supposed to be doing, whatever it is. Finally, and although Molly is back home on time, they do manage to stay out of trouble. So the day is saved. That is, first, there are a lot of things happening here. Molly has come home on time. Molly is not late. Molly may find out they are mischief or whatever it is, they have fulfilled the condition that will let them stay out of trouble. Okay? That is, they are not going to find themselves in trouble because they did what they are told to. Molly does not know about it. Molly does not know what happened in the meantime. And therefore, the day is saved. That is, all is well. And Fred and George do not find themselves in trouble. So there's a lot of there are a lot of things going here and this is what this last sentence does. It tells you the relationship between what happens and why it happens. It answers the question why. It gives you reasons. And we move on to another exercise now. So, another exercise for you is to look at these sentences and convince yourself that they are all sentences. Here, we present a dialogue which consists of sentences spoken by Fred and George, who are two characters. So Fred and George are talking to each other. And these are all examples of sentences. Look at them and convince yourself that they are all examples of sentences. I'll read you. I'll read them for you. Fred. Hi there. George. Where's Molly? Fred. She's gone to the market with Ronald. George. Has she? And when should they return? Fred. She'll return in an hour's time. Oh yes, Molly's asked you to get the laundry done and uh, she wants us to have all our things prepared for the morning. Now, pause the video. Think of what kind of sentences these are. For example, the first one is a greeting. And I want you to think of the kind of sentence it is. Let's move on to the next exercise. Clauses. I want you to find the clauses in these sentences. I'll read it for you. The vase that is standing there is oriental. Dumbledore is the man whom I met yesterday. Being happy, he greeted us with a cheer. The family, or Harry's relatives, lived in a suburb of London. When evening came, we returned home. What was that? Wasn't that splendid? Now, I want you to find the clauses, pause the video, try to find the clauses, and then return for the answers. Did you try? I hope you did. Okay, so the answers. The vase that is standing there 
is oriental. That is standing there is one clause, the whole sentence is another. Dumbledore is a man whom I met, met yesterday. Whom I met yesterday is a clause, it's a relative clause by the way, and the whole sentence is another clause. There are two clauses in the third sentence, and the whole sentence is in itself a clause, but it doesn't have a coordinating conjunction, and this is a special kind of sentence. But we'll look into that later. Right now, there are two clauses, being happy and he greeted us with a chair, and the entire clause, being happy, he greeted us with a chair. Fourth sentence, the family, or Harry's relatives, lived in a suburb of London. The family is Dursley's, by the way. So, who are Harry's relatives is a clause, a relative clause, and it's a non-essential clause or non-defining clause, by the way. And the entire sentence is a clause. Okay, I can be thought of as a clause. When evening came in the next sentence is a clause and the entire sentence is another clause. We return home is the third clause we see in this sentence. The sixth sentence, what was that, is a clause in itself and there's not much to it. What is the subject? Was that is the predicate by the way and similarly final sentence, seventh sentence, wasn't that suspended is another example of a sentence and a clause. And that's that. Let's move on to another exercise. Now, next exercise is on phrases, and I'd like you to find the phrase in these sentences. I'll read them out for you. Remember that phrases are not a subject predicate arrangement. The thing that you see in the picture was used to win our chaff from grey. At the place, in the small hours of the day, in the shade of the overlooking hill, we saw the sun from the far east rising with all its glory. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. The last one of all who stood there was the one we meant. Pause the video and find the phrases. Return for answers. So here are the answers uh, to the question and phrases. The thing that you see is a phrase. In the picture is another. Was used is also a phrase. To win a shaft from grain is another example of phrase. At the place, in the small hours of the day, the shade of the Olin Hill from the Far East and all its glory are all phrases. Now we're not going right now into kinds of phrases, we're just keeping it to phrase or clauses and that layer of well structural analysis. Anyway, a thing of beauty is a phrase. The last one of all is another. The one is also a phrase. Finally, we're entering sleepily and among the and among hill and dale are phrases. I can tell you there are, there are verb phrases and noun phrases and preposition phrases here. But I don't want to go into that right now. So we'll keep it to whether it is a phrase or not. The simple rule is that whatever is not a clause is a phrase. Let's move on to the next exercise. Now today we've seen a lot of things and subject predicate uh, division was one of them. So I want you to separate these sentences, the subject and the predicate the sentence and indicate the head word or subject word or the principal noun let us call it in the subject and so in the predicate indicate the verb also which is the main part of the whole predicate i'll read it for you fred and george happy about tomorrow's prospect made merry they were birds of a feather suddenly a jolly woman entered the house the woman carrying big bags who entered was molly Fred was taken by surprise, and so was George. But here's a mischief under the belt. They were saved this time. The last sounds coming off the house were of loud cracks and cackling geese. Pause the video. Try to find out the subject, the predicate, and their main words, that is, the noun and the verb, and return for answers. Here are your answers. The first sentence you have Fred and George, and there are two subjects Fred, George, and the subject is there are two subject words that is Fred, this other one is George, and uh, the highlighted part is the subject, the entire subject Fred and George, happy about tomorrow's prospect. Made is the word we're looking for in the predicate, and predicate in the first sentence is made merry. They were birds of a feather. So the sub the sentence is about a subject and the subject here is they, that is a pronoun referring to Fred and George. Were birds of a feather. So verb 
Ver is the verb you look for in the predicate, and the predicate is in the white. Is in white. A verb birds of a feather. Next sentence. Suddenly, a jolly woman entered the house. So, a jolly woman is the subject, and woman is the head word or the subject word or the noun that we are looking for in the subject. Suddenly goes with the predicate, and entered is the verb that you look for in the predicate. The woman carrying big bags who entered was Molly. Now, here woman is the subject, and the predicate is was Molly. You'd also notice that this is a clause, or sorry, I beg your pardon. This is like the previous sentence that we've seen about Dumbledore is a phrase, a noun phrase, and who entered is a clause. Again, the woman carrying big bags who entered was Molly. So the woman, woman is subject word, was Molly is the predicate, and was the verb in the predicate that we look for. Fred was taken by surprise, and so was George. Now this sentence has two subjects again, Fred, George, and the rest of it is predicate. And these, this sentence is basically a compound sentence, which is composed of two different sentences joined together by the conjunction and. But we are not going into that level of detail right now. With ears of mischief under their belt, they. This is the subject, this is the entire subject, and I want you to think why the with to belt part doesn't go with the predicate, and why it goes with subject instead. They is the subject, they is a pronoun, and it refers to Fred and George. We we'll save this time simply the predicate, and the verb you're looking for is were. The last sounds coming off the house, this is the subject in the final sentence, and the head word or subject word is sounds, modified by other words in the subject. Were of loud cracks and caffeine geese. So, the predicate has the verb were. Okay, and this exercise is done. Let's move on to another one. Find out the part of speech each word in the text belongs to. I'll read it for you. There goes the partner. Here comes George. And he said, What's the matter? Therefore, it followed that something went astray. But then, as this is true or that, doxa is a Greek borrowing, but apostle a Latin one. These words are typical examples of a key feature describing growth of the English language through centuries. What excellent nosh! Now, pause the video, attempt the answer, and return for the correct one. Now the answers. As you can see, I've colored all of the parts of speech in different colors, and we'll look at them one by one. There, here, astray are adverbs, goes, comes, said, is, follows, went, is, is, are, describing, are verbs, the ones in white are articles, Atna, George, matter, something, doxa, borrowing, apostle, words, examples, feature, growth, language, centuries, nosh, function as noun, and, therefore, that, but, either, or, but, or, conjunctions, and then, Greek, Latin, key, English, what an excellent adjectives the pronouns are he what it this and that in all that one these so that's that and now i have some homework for you i hope you'll do it i request you to do it for homework i'd like you to mark these sentences as a declarative exclamatory interrogative or incorrect and lastly, I would like you to grab a text and find the following in it. Any text you like, just find a text, one or more, and find examples of these. Conjunctions, subject predicate, parts of speech, there are eight parts of speech, remember, and we have articles as a separate heading for now. If we keep it as a separate heading. And then finally, clauses and phrases. Also, notice how punctuation is used. Thanks for watching this video. See you next time.